This is the Rising Tide Startups Podcast, where we chat with startup founders from all over the globe to help you escape the cubicle and begin your own startup journey. Make sure you take notes. Every episode of Rising Tide Startups is sponsored by Podbrand Media. Let Podbrand create and host your company branded podcast. Learn more at podbrandmedia.com. This is Kevin Pro with another episode of Rising Tide Startups and my special guest special guest. My special guest today is Shanif Danani. Shanif, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. Hey Kevin, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So I asked him how to pronounce his name before, and but I didn't ask him how to pronounce the word guest. So I, maybe I, I should change the uh, the entire intro and ask you how to it, you know pronounce the whole sentence that I'm going to speak when I first start. But man, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. But if you and I met at a networking event, how would you introduce yourself to me? I would probably first say I'm a data geek because that's what I, uh, it's like the honest truth. And I love to just be honest. But then I would probably say that I'm the founder of a company called Locusive, uh, which is helping businesses connect their data to AI. Uh, I've worked in AI for a long time now, so I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit more about it. So to the to the common lay person like myself, I mean, there's not a you don't hear a lot on, you know, at that level when you talk about AI, it's almost like it's all related to content, you know, instead of data. So walk us through the kind of the intersection of AI and data. Don't drill too deep because we can get into that later in the conversation, <laughs> but just at a high level, just talk about what what is the intersection of, of those two main elements? Yeah, it's funny, you know, because as someone who's been doing this for a while, you almost take for granted that uh, you need a lot of data to make AI. But ultimately, if you if you think about AI today, there's sort of this hype and buzzword around it. Some people think it's Terminator. Some people think it's AI. It's going to take over our jobs. Um, for someone who's been working at it in a, for a while, AI is really just math, uh, using math to find a bunch of patterns. And so in order to build something like ChatGPT or an AI system, you need to do what's called training it, which is really just mm -hmm. helping it find these patterns. And in order to find the patterns, you need to give it data to do so. Now, the cool thing is once it learns these patterns, you can apply it on new data. And so if you're yeah. using ChatGPT, you know, you think of writing content, long form articles, social media posts, but whatever you're giving it to write, that input prompt, that's just another piece of data that it's right. using. Right. And so maybe it's just a different way of saying, you know, content, um, you know, the geeky data, the geeky data scientist way. But that's how I think about it. I, I probably was leaning a little more toward the content output, you know, versus, you know, the the inputs that you just you mentioned. But so nobody just wakes up and just says, hey, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to be a consultant in the AI space. So walk us through kind of that journey. And from what I remember, there's this uh, there's this little blip on the screen on the uh, timeline there that says something about Twitter. If you want to mention that as well. Yeah, you know, I've, I've had an interesting uh, career. It's it's been fun. So I started working in the world of software and then when you work in software you're inevitably going to come across data science which is today called ai most relevant like i i helped start this company about a decade ago now we were one of the first mobile advertising platforms and really all that means is we were serving or handling about a million ad requests on mobile apps and some of our customers were large retailers and we would show apps or show ads on their behalf now, in order to be able to show that many ads, you need a pretty complicated system that can understand, is this the right place to show an ad for this customer? And to do that, you have to predict a few things. You have to predict, hey, you know, what's the likelihood that this person is going to click on this ad? What's the likelihood that somebody's going to make a purchase after clicking on that ad? So we built this system. It was a company called Tap Commerce. Then we sold that company over to Twitter. And so I started doing a lot As of the same one stuff. Does. He says that so nonchalantly. <laughs> I had a couple of, couple of companies laying around that Twitter bought, you know, it's like, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm sorry. Go finish your story. It's it's funny because it's like such a, uh, such a core part of who I am now that I just take it for granted. But um, it was a long process. You know, we were working 3 a.m., 4 a.m. nights for about two years, probably the hardest thing I've built. But uh, looking back on it now, we, we were very fortunate and I'm very thankful for the, the, the good fortune, um, but we did end up selling it to Twitter and that's because they wanted to build similar systems for themselves. And so I started working on their own internal ad systems 
And I was like, you know what, man, I'm kind of done with ads. But I started looking at other products that they were working on. I became a data scientist for Moments, which is a product that lasted for about 20 seconds. <laughs> and then I worked on their onboarding flow. Eventually, I had to go back to startup life. So I started another company uh, doing predictive analytics for marketing. And now that lands me where I am today, which is, you know, we moved on from that company and started something new here where we are essentially helping businesses use tools like ChatGPT or use tools like generative AI with their own data. So for me, you're absolutely right. Like it's been a long journey. I didn't just wake up and say, hey, I want to help <laughs> help companies use AI better. Um, but I've worked in this space for a while and I just love it. I love AI. So that's how I got here. Talk about that. You used a, a really interesting transition where there you said we we started this, this predictive analysis company, then we moved on. So what does define yeah. moved on for me? Is it a is that a pivot? Is that a we shut the doors? Is that a we kind of, you know, bankroll the yeah. assets out? I mean, what is what is moved on or did, did did really the playing field change and you just pivoted? Uh, it's a great question because, you know, on the one hand, like I've had this great fortune with Tap Commerce, and on the other hand, we actually just shut shut our doors. It was one of those things where raised a little bit of money and we started building a product. We It took us a little bit of time to hit product market fit. Mm -hmm. We eventually did. And in our last year, we were actually growing quite a bit. We grew like 600% uh, year over year. Now, problem was we we ran into a few issues. One, we ran into a market in the world of e-commerce that was slowing down and shuttering a lot of uh, stores. And so that was a big problem. And then we ran into another issue where a lot of the VCs were starting to drive, like starting to invest less and less. And so we had decided, hey, look, like we built something, we tried to sell some of the assets, we tried to sell some of the IP. Ultimately, we weren't uh, weren't able to do it successfully. So, you know, just a few years after fortunately selling uh, tap commerce. We I had the opposite side of the equation, um, and unfortunately, the side that most startups see, which is hey, you know, shutting down the company was the best option for us mm -hmm. at the time. It was rough, but it gave me the opportunity to move on and figure out what it is that I really wanted to work on next. And I'm doing things a little bit differently now. So that's ultimately the story there. I, I appreciate you you know, dive into that because I mean we can talk about you know just the success stories, but really I mean it's the entire story you know together. Oh, but yeah. um, would you say that you you can't transition from that company because like you were just running through cash, or was were you just come to a point you said you know what this really doesn't fit anymore? It doesn't you know we kind of lost our market, we kind of done this so. Let's go try something that we think that has a much higher rate of success. There, there were a couple of issues that we ran into, which I am now working as hard as I can to not get into them again. But the first one was, believe it or not, raising money. We raised money, but we did it in a way that hampered us because we didn't quite have the right product and we didn't have product market fit. Mm -hmm. Now, when you raise VC money, that ultimately means you're expected to produce a return or you're ultimately expected to make traction. Now, if you're trying to make traction on a product where you don't have product market fit, you're sort of running into a bunch of issues. Mm -hmm. I came from the world before where Tap Commerce, the, the company we sold to Twitter, where we actually pivoted 12 times. So my, my thesis at Aptio was, Aptio was the last startup, the one that we had to shut down. My thesis was, hey, if we pivot fast enough, we'll be able to find something. We did. We actually found a great market. But we had burned through about a year and a half or two of cash at that point, and we actually, I wouldn't even say we burned through it. Our expenses were anywhere from 20K a month to 40K, tried to keep things pretty low. But after two years of supporting salaries for a startup, uh, for a small team of startup folks, you are sort of spending money. Yeah. And so the first problem was once we found the initial inklings of product market fit, we weren't able to show enough traction to VCs to allow us to keep going. And then the second thing was when we eventually got to where we did, um, we ultimately landed in a world where e-commerce had grown like crazy during the pandemic and it was sort of slowing down. And so we got hit by a double whammy where our core market was slowing down and we weren't able to raise cash because ultimately we had product market fit a little bit too late. And, you know, ultimately VCs, even though they say they invest early, they like to see traction very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that's why raising money at that such an early stage may not have been the best move for us. Now, one thing I would say is had we raised a little bit more money, we might've been okay. We raised enough money to last us about 18 months, but ultimately that allowed us, that led us to a point where we weren't able to go a little bit longer to show more traction. 
So the the VCs that invested on the front end, when you did you go back to them and say, hey, uh, let's let's raise another round here because we can we think we found product market fit. Give us six more months, give us 12 more months, whatever runway, and and we will show you that return. Where it was was the was the VC like finance market? Was it tightening up at that time? Did you experience that? Or was it just the ones that you just happened to choose had it had maybe a different perspective? There's a yeah, there's a couple of things here. So one, our existing investors had um done one uh, then two extension rounds. One of them um, had a lot of the VCs continue on. The other were some newer angels and newer VCs. And so they had already extended a little bit. Now, again, going back to the problem I had first, which was sh I should have raised a lot more money so we didn't have to do these extension mm -hmm. rounds. You've probably heard of people say, as soon as you finish your first fundraise, you got to start thinking about the next <laughs> one. That's a really tough place to be in. And if you raise yeah. enough in the first round, you don't need to worry about that. So getting back to your question, if we had um, we had them extend it a couple of times, and then for when we had started really accelerating growth, we went back to them and to a couple of other folks, and we actually a lot of other folks, and we said, "Hey, look, like we're showing this traction. We would love to talk a little bit more." I think that we just the timing got us. Like timing, this was back at uh, Q two of twenty twenty two when things were really hitting a wall. Mm -hmm. You might have seen some of the stats yourself yeah. where things have really slowed down, and they still haven't picked back up. All right. So we got hit by the timing. Um, if we had had like six more months, I bet you we would have been able to show pretty significant growth in ARR. We had finally learned how to close deals pretty quickly. We had finally learned a couple of go-to-market motions that were delivering results. And we just sort of had to cut things short, unfortunately, because we didn't have the cash to keep going. Uh, now, biggest mistake a CEO can make is running out of cash. So I beat myself up about it a little bit, but at the same time, I learned a lot. And mm -hmm. that sort of has, has guided me since then. Would have you ever thought about what this would have looked like if it had started two years earlier? All the I time, mean, you know. Yeah, I can I can't <laughs> imagine how if you would have really if you'd have found that product market fit about the time COVID hit, I mean, we wouldn't be having this oh, conversation yeah. right now. I I wouldn't even be able to get to you. I would have to go through your people. <laughs> <laughs> set up some, you know that's possible i like to make i love to join join podcasts so it's certainly possible but at the same time um you know i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised if we had chatted directly but i do look at it i do think about it uh, i'm the type of person who doesn't really regret taking action so it's not like i look back and i say oh man i wish i had done this two years earlier but had we done it two years earlier we could have captured that growth phase that was really really big in the world of e-commerce and mm -hmm. personalized yep. ai which is what our solution was solving and so it really does go to show you how big of an impact timing makes, mm -hmm. at least when you combine it with things like fundraising and things like product market fit, like it all sort of has to come into play right. um, if you go down that really aggressive route of raising VC money. I, I think you can look back at almost every success, every large success story, and all those three things had to be in place. I mean, timing certainly played a key role. I, I mean, would Facebook be Facebook oh, yeah. today? Probably not. You know, so it's it's interesting that uh, that you you mentioned that, but I, I I really like your perspective about the fact that you know don't look back because uh, and if you do look back at them as learnings, not failures. So how do, how can you apply what you learned in the in the past to you know moving forward? But it's it's a it's a great segue to a to a question that that I love to ask on this podcast, and it talks a little bit about like entrepreneurial DNA. Yeah. Like, do you think that, um, I mean, it sounds like to me that you wouldn't make a very good employee. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that with the greatest respect and admiration. So it, it sounds like to me that maybe you were kind of born to, uh, you know, you have a little higher risk tolerance, you have a little higher, you know, you always have a gear inside you that's kind of spinning that's saying, you know, what can we do? What can be done? What's out there? What are the opportunities out there? So um, do you do you think that that you know entrepreneurs are different than say business owners you know or those who run businesses and is it is it in your DNA? Gosh, I was um, I was talking with a buddy of mine who was also a founder, and we were just thinking like if we we can't even work at big companies now. I started my career working at a big company and then I tried it at Twitter and it was one of those things where I was just like. I just can't, like, I can't even I fathom. I can't breathe. <laughs> yeah, really. It's like, <laughs> my gosh, that just worries me. Um, now, at the same time, you got to get it. You got to make money. And so do you, 
yeah, that's a whole other yeah. uh, concern when it comes to founders. But to your question, you know, do we are we built differently? I'm 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 very inclined to say yes. Um, now the reason I hesitate is because founders who go the crazy Silicon Valley route, raise a bunch of money, are built even differently than founders who are bootstrappers or, mm-hmm. or start small businesses, which may be service businesses. Sure. Um, so when you're talking about entrepreneurs, there's even subclasses of entrepreneurs. And mm-hmm. so the folks that are starting these large um, venture-backed companies, they are a totally different breed. Like they are kind of crazy. They're like, they're pretty crazy, right? Like they're really <laughs> risk of like, they don't care about risk. They just care about vision. Their ability to sell people on an idea is amazing. They probably could move on to any job they wanted because they're really, really good at working with people. Um, so there's that, there's that person. And then there's the bootstrapper, the folks who are like building from the ground up, uh, getting customers, getting paying customers and growing through profitability. That's a certainly a different type of person. But I think every person who starts a business has a few things in common. The ability to get past that risk issue, which I think is probably overblown. Like I think that there's just as much risk starting a company as there is working at a company. The ability to get past that, the ability to see a bigger picture, the ability Mm -hmm. to hope and be optimistic. Whether or not we're born with those things or we make them ourselves, I don't know. I think I'm a believer in the fact that you can adapt uh, if you choose to do so. But I do think that there are certain traits that are probably shared by all of these people. A lot of these people are born with those traits. So um, we're different and we're a little bit weird for sure. Whether or not we're not we're born with it, I don't know. I think it's weird in a good way. So I I mean, I, I look back at my own life and I'm thinking, you know, I was like eight, 10 years old and I'm schlepping candy bars in the neighborhood, you know, because <laughs> and my friends are out there playing. I'm like, yeah, I, I want to make a buck here. I got to make some money for vacation, you know, that type <laughs> of thing. So I think there there is a little bit of genetic disposition in you know, that sales that leads to, you know, wanting to kind of lead something on your own. But I think another huge thing I think that that entrepreneurs have is vision and the ability to cast vision to a team to get them to work together to to accomplish whatever you're you're working towards. So what are you know, when I, I do want to stop right here because I, I want to give a spot for an ad spot here. But when we come back, I want to talk exactly the whole idea of, you know, lessons learned and and how you cast vision for a team. So I want to hear from our sponsors right now. Have you been wanting to start a podcast but not sure where to start? Well, now you can start a podcast in less than 24 hours. I'm David Ezel, and I'll walk you through all of the things that you need to get started today. Things like how to choose the right microphone, how to edit your audio, and how to find guests and build a pipeline of future guests. This course does a great job of keeping things high level while also diving into the things that keep most people from starting. Even better, if you use the code RISING at checkout, you'll get 20% off your purchase. But that's only if you use the code RISING at checkout. What are you waiting for? Start your podcast today. We are back, and what a great conversation we're having with our guests today. Shanif, thanks again for uh, joining us on Rising Tide, but I, I really want to drill down on, you know, we were talking just before the break about, um, you know, being an entrepreneur and are you unemployable and leading a team and all that, but talk about, you know, the importance in your mind of being able to cast vision for your team as you lead them as CEO. Vision is really important. And it's one of those things where I think that it's become misconstrued in the world of Silicon Valley. Like everybody thinks, oh, these founders have this amazing vision of how the world is going to look in 30 years. And you can build immediately to that. I think of vision a little bit differently. I think about how can you iteratively make progress towards solving the problem that you're trying to solve using the resources at your disposal and getting to an end state. In my case, vision is the knowledge that, especially in the world of AI, it's the, I know that AI is going to change the world. I know that businesses mm-hmm. are going to be using this in five years and 10 years. Do I know exactly how it's going to be? Not really, but I have a very strong idea of where it's going. And so my vision is one of, because I know businesses are going to need this, let's start building, especially early stage, let's start building in the world where we have the immediate problem, we have the immediate solution, and let's grow from there. The vision I've got is... Let's identify the best opportunities for the company, tackle those using calculated risk and grow. It may not necessarily be, hey, let's build a self-driving car. It may not necessarily be, hey, let's build a spaceship that goes to Mars. I think that those folks who are able to do that are amazing. 
those are sort of very few and far between, but you've got a lot of founders who can take this, this concept of this is where we are now. This is where we want to be. Here's this big gap and here are the steps that get there. So in my case, vision is maybe looking beyond where you are today and trying to get to a better state. I think that maybe differs from non-founders where you're sort of more concerned with this is my day to day. This is what I'm trying to get through. Here are my tasks, my to-do lists. So it's maybe a little bit of a different answer than uh, you might've been expecting, but I think that vision is misconstrued sometimes into like these wild, amazing ideas of the way the world is going to work. And certainly the folks who do really well have that idea, but for every one Elon Musk, there's nine, nine million, nine hundred ninety nine thousand other people who had visions that just didn't make it come through. I think the best founders have vision in the sense of this is how we're going to execute to a place where we can build a really big company. So it sounds like a little bit more your your the way you would define vision is almost directional versus destinational. You know, it's like, you know, how do we how do we accomplish this task where we're this before us? How do we solve this problem? What's the direction we need to head? What are the things we need to do? The the steps we need to take? You know, it's almost like a an engineer's approach to you know to solving the problem, so to speak, and. Uh, but but still with with the idea that says, hey, I, I want you to come along with me on this journey. You know, I'm you definitely. Of- yeah, you definitely need to be able to sell people and you sell on emotions and people people will respond to big visions. People will respond to, hey, we're building a, a spaceship to go to Mars. Come join us. Um, I've noticed because I do have a, a technical background. I've noticed engineers will also respond to saying, hey, this is a really tough problem. Come and solve it. And so that we'll be able to get X, you know, X customers, which will allow you to be able to build Y cool new features and you'll be able mm-hmm. to get freedom. And so if you're building a really technical product, like Tap Commerce was really technical, Aptio was pretty technical. If you're building those types of products, that uh, directional vision, as you called it, can be really good for uh, attracting folks who are needed uh, to build a particular product at a particular point in time. And that can also lead to funding. Like if you've got the right way to approach a product de- development um, uh, task, you can get investors to be really interested. Now, what's interesting is Locusive is a little bit different. It's it's a product that requires a lot of code, but it's not so technical that we need researchers. It's not so technical we need AI experts. But now I've got a vision that's like, hey, look, AI is going to take over the world. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had these autonomous uh, assistants that could help you find everything you needed when you needed them and then even take action on your behalf? And now the vision is going to be a little bit different. Like the, the vision I've got now may or may not attract engineers, but it may attract folks who are interested in working on that. So mm-hmm. It may even be the case that directional vision is required for some types of companies and sort of grand vision is required for others. Yeah. But I think you're right. You have to be able to sell. I went off a little bit on a tangent. You have to be able to sell your idea to companies and to people who are going to join you along the way because it's really, really solo, isolating, lonely process when you don't have those folks to uh, to help you out. Do you, I mean, you're casting the vision with me because you're 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 making me see you know, the application and, and future, but... Do you see the uh, an application in the finance industry, like in investing? Do you see? I mean, is that uh, where where I guess where are your primary customers, or are there certain verticals that you are focusing on right now? Yeah, I'll, you know, the, it's a really interesting two part question. I'll answer the first one really quickly. When I started Aptio, we were actually using AI to help finance people and stock investors invest in stocks better. We were what we were doing at the time was using. AI, which is a lot less sophisticated than it is today, but mm-hmm. using AI to read financial articles, combine mm-hmm. that with information from stock markets and using that to predict which stocks are going to do better. We actually had a really good track record, but we could not sell this thing to anybody. We couldn't sell this tool to anyone, even professional investors. And so it's really like what what I learned from that is you ne- you need some sort of mark you need some sort of market demand pulling you mm-hmm. to the product that you're building. And so because of that, um, there's certainly so many applications in finance. There's optimization for trades. There's uh, reading a, reading documents uh, and getting insights out of them. There's a lot of stuff there. But today, we don't. I don't focus on finance as much. One, it's a hard market to sell into, and two, mm-hmm. it's just like it's sort of overdone. Where I'm focusing now on is I really work. I really like working with um, small businesses, actually where we can implement AI for them that improves their operations right away. 
I don't necessarily want to stay in the world of small business forever. I believe there's a lot of opportunity with enterprise, but the way I'm thinking about things right now is proving out the initial product I've got now, mostly with professional services firms. So consultants, um, financial planners, um, researchers, uh, any anyone who's doing like professional services, giving them a tool that can help them better understand their data, ask questions, figure out answers, understanding what they need from the tool and then sort of building it upwards. Um, my hope is that I can eventually break into the world of like larger SaaS companies because I think that that's a really interesting play. Um, SaaS companies tend to build things for themselves though, so you have to build a really good product. Um, but it's a long way of saying absolutely a ton of applications in finance, but this is such an interesting technology that there's a ton of applications everywhere. Mm -hmm. I've just decided to start in professional services for now. Yeah, that I mean, that makes perfect sense. And I, I the I think the thing that uh, is interesting about you know people talk about you know focusing on small businesses or even startups is the one thing you hear especially about startups is startups don't have any money. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> especially bootstraps. So it, it might yeah you're gonna have to pay the bill somewhere, but. Uh, is it is it important in your mind for entrepreneurs to be passionate about the service or product, or does it not matter? You just it doesn't matter. I don't care. I'll, I'll sell widgets. It doesn't matter as long as there's a product market fit and and like you said, yeah. so demand pull. Then then uh, yeah, I'll sell anything. Gosh, if you had asked me, my my answer to this would have been different ten years ago versus five years ago versus today. Ten years ago, I would have said. It doesn't matter at all. Like as long as there's product market fit, go and build it and sell it. Five years ago, I would have probably said, well, you probably want to really care about what it is you're doing and you probably want something here and there. Today, I'm like, the best folks are going to be really passionate about what they're doing. doesn't mean you can't start a business right. um, where you're not passionate, but you are going to burn out. You're going to burn out before you can actually get there. And so it's really funny. At least this is me. I can't speak for everybody, but I I know that there are some people who can go out and sell anything to anybody, and that's what they're happy doing. And those are some of the best entrepreneurs out there. They don't care. They just want to make money. And that's you know those are the guys who are making these giant companies. All amazing work. Very lots of respect to them. But the rest of us, which I would argue is a majority of folks, need to be able to care about some aspect of what we're doing. Ideally, you care not only about the folks that you're helping, but the problem you're solving and the technology you're building. Mm -hmm. but it, it's like, you got to have at least one of those. Like I, I really appreciate working with the types of customers I'm working with now, but I also appreciate the technology and I was really having fun doing it about three or four years in Aptio. I got really burned out. I wasn't really that interested in, in what we were doing. So I was working more on the sense of like, Hey, my investors have invested in me. I got an obligation. I need to fulfill it, which is great, but that sort of burns you out a little bit and, and it's going to cause you to, slow down a lot versus if you're really working on something you care about, you're able to keep going just for the love of what you're doing. Um, so I, I would say today that it's really important to be passionate as an entrepreneur. Maybe it's not as someone who's got a nine to five, but someone who's really working on their own thing, you got to be passionate about it. And that's really one of the things that I have focused on a lot this year as well is finding the thing I'm, I'm passionate about so I can solve that problem. And I, like you mentioned, I mean, there are going to be difficult days. There are going to be difficult weeks, months, you know, the, and if it's years, something that yeah. is getting you out of years, it's getting you out of bed, <laughs> you know, because you believe in the process and you believe in the, in the end result. And I, I, I would agree with you. I think it does matter. Um, not, not that it, it matters to everyone, but I think to a large majority out there, I think it does matter. It kind of gets you over that, you know, Seth Godin talked about getting through the dip, you know, so to speak. Yeah. So um, I, you mentioned, you know, the successes, the pivots, the the moving on, I think was the trans transition you used. You can call it a failure. That's yeah, all good. No, with no, me. no. I, <laughs> I like that. I love that, that pivoting positively, you know, that the idea is a failing forward. But yep. talk about just as a as a CEO, not not any specific company you're leading or whatever, but what are one or two just, you know, one line learnings that you think would be really helpful to somebody that's a little further behind you on the journey? It's, this is going to be especially true for technologists, but it applies to everybody. Um, fall in love with the problem that you're solving because that's really the thing that you're going to be working towards for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can change over time, but you need to be working towards solving a problem. The, the contrary thing to this is, you know, don't have a technology where you're looking for a problem. Find the problem first, figure out how to best solve it, and then apply whatever technology you need to to solve that problem. 
the major, a large portion of startups fail when they just build something that nobody wants. And mm-hmm. so finding a problem that's worth solving uh, is really important. I would sort of add on a secondary piece to that, which is validate that this problem is big enough that people care about it. You know, the, the people are going to need to have to pay you in order for you to succeed. And if nobody's willing to pay or if only a few people are willing to pay, then it's not worth it. That's like the most important sort of one liner I would give. Now, you've probably seen this yourself, Kevin, like I could probably find 90 other things to say. So I don't want to bore <laughs> your guests, but your listeners, but that's what I'll I'll say if I had to choose one. I, I think that I love that, you know, it's not only just falling in love with the problem you're trying to solve, but finding a problem worth solving. You know, I mean, you can fall in love with something that's that's worth what's worthless, you know, or yeah. it doesn't have yeah. a large enough market or um, and you're exactly right. I mean, how many people have built a really cool toy that nobody wanted, <laughs> you know, oh, man. Um, that, that is like, this is the greatest thing ever, but nobody need, nobody wanted, nobody's asking for it. You know, it's just something you liked, yeah. you know, you, you thought was a good idea at the time, but you didn't do, didn't do your research enough uh, to, to validate that fit. But um, you, we mentioned really early, just kind of the, the intersection, you know, of, of AI and business and, and what you're seeing, I mean, in the, from a big picture standpoint, I mean, you you see people on the news all the time saying, "Hey, you know, we got to get get this under control, or it's going <laughs> to it's going to blow up in our face." Type thing. Give me your professional take on just the AI space in general. That's a big one. Um, That's a big one. I'll yeah, I'll start with I'll start with saying that I've seen the evolution of AI over the past ten years where. At first, it was just taking a look at a spreadsheet and then forecasting one column or predicting the values of one column. And then it became generating images and then it became deep fakes and then it became AI like LLMs. And now you're able to sort of generate things at a human level that you could never do before. And so AI, like the first thing I always like to tell people is AI is basically just this branch of computer science where you're trying to do things that humans do. That's all it is. Forget about Terminator, forget about Skynet, forget about all this other stuff. And what is sort of the common feature around everything that's been AI developed into AI today? It's just math. So from my perspective, I might be oversimplifying it. It might be overly reductionist, but AI is just math. And so when you start talking about AI taking over the world or generating, becoming artificial general intelligence, I tend to sh- like cringe a little bit because maybe I'm overly technical and I kind of I kind of see the implementation rather than the um, uh, the effects of it. I understand the need for regulation. I understand the need to like, Hey, look, like if you are, if suddenly every, every company in the world is producing AI generated content and you're impersonating me as a person and I, mm-hmm. and you're making videos that never where I doing stuff I never did. That's a huge problem. Uh, and so I think we need to come up with some sort of rules of decency, but AI is a technology I think is going to continue to develop. I think we're going to continue to see machines being able to do things that uh, originally we, we thought only humans could do, which is going to lead to more and more and more automation. I'm of the opinion that more automation might lead to fewer jobs in the short term, but generally leads to more jobs in the long term. Mm-hmm. We're at a weird spot now where this stuff is getting really powerful. And so I don't know if that's going to continue. I think it will. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to lead to more jobs in the long run. Uh, but it also means that we're going to have to find new ways to go to work. We're going to have to find new ways to make money. Maybe we'll have to do UBI. Um, and all, all, it all comes down to the fact that more and more things are going to be done automatically, which might allow us to focus on other things, or it might allow, it might force us to, uh, I don't know, figure out new ways to work. Um, so that's like the highest, like hundred thousand foot view. I'm happy to dive deeper into the one foot view, but that's sort of my, my take on AI as a whole. I, uh, I'll give you a, a, an interesting example. I was watching uh, online the other day, and I see this. This uh, supposedly it was a press conference of one of the coaches for the Iowa football team, and he he said this statement and talked about you know how he's under pressure with his contract. He's got to average a certain number of points. Uh, he's the offensive coordinator. He's got to average a certain number of points. That entire video was AI. <laughs> no, it was a fake and it looked so genuine and absolutely just duped everyone, including me who watched it. And I'm thinking, yeah. man, this is guy, what an idiot to, to be so bold, <laughs> you know, to talk about this. You're thinking, you know, sometimes it's better to shut up, you know, and not say anything, but it found, you know, found out this is a fake, but 
it's out there ubiquitously. And I'm thinking, how do you rein that back in? If you're that guy, if you're that guy's PR director, how do you rein that back in? And it just seemed like it just, it just took a life of its own and was like a snowball rolling downhill, you know, just gaining momentum. But that, that's just a, a unique example I've seen recently, you know, of, of how it is so easy to kind of dupe the masses, you know, me being part of the masses here, but uh uh, I, I really like your take of just kind of looking at it from, a, you know, we're heading this direction anyway. It does have some really, really exceptional um, benefits, you know, if if we if it's used correctly. But what uh, what's one thing that we that I just haven't asked you about as we wrap up today that uh, you just like to a closing thought you think would be helpful? A lot of uh, a lot of business owners I talk to are they're trying to figure out how to best use this stuff, but they don't really know how. And so I always like to end with something practical, which is if you haven't tried chat GPT yet, just go and try it, mm -hmm. you know, like try to figure out, Hey, can this actually write a blog post for me? Or can it write an outline? I started using it as a coder. I, I just plugged in this coding tool called copilot and it started helping me out. And then I started using it more. And so the one thing you can't be a, is afraid, like you can't be afraid of this stuff coming in and taking your taking over, you know, a uh, share of your market or putting you out of business. You just have to learn how to use this stuff. So first and foremost, just just don't don't be afraid to start using it right away. And then, you know, as you get more and more familiar with it, you're going to find applications for where to use mm -hmm. it. Sometimes you can use stuff out of the box like just the chat GPT website. More and more you're going to start using custom built applications. Uh, so that's what I'll end with, you know, Try using it, get familiar with it, and then you'll eventually see where it can be applied to your organization. And it becomes another tool, and you can use it to grow. I love that. So, so share with our our audience where's the best place to to connect with you to learn more about you know what your company provides. Uh, you know, LinkedIn. Yeah. Where where is it? Yeah, I'll give you a, a couple of ways to contact me. So you can always contact me directly. My email is. Shanif at locusive.com. That's L O C U S I V E.com. Uh, Locusive is the name of the company I started. And so you can learn more about our products there, uh, locusive.com. We offer different tools to help people connect their data to um, ChatGPT or to other LLMs. This includes chatbots, question and answer, enterprise search. We also offer services. So check us out there. And then if you want, I'm pretty prolific on LinkedIn. Like I mm -hmm. post a lot there. So LinkedIn.com. Uh, slash in slash Shanif Danani. So always good to, all, I'm always happy to chat with folks who are interested in this stuff. Well, Shanif, we will make sure that those are in the show notes, uh, ways to, to get in touch with you. But uh, man, just thanks again for just taking time and your busy schedule and uh, just educating us more in this space that is, you know, so such a mystery to many. And I uh, just love hearing your story and and just, you know, your the way you were honest and open with, you know, sharing the the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, of the journey. But at the end of the day, I mean, you're still smiling and heading in a positive direction. So thank you for just sharing your story and just playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Shneef, have a great evening. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. I hope you heard some great takeaways from our guests today. Make sure you reach out to them and thank you again for playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide.